Welcome to Real Estate Secrets Unlocked, the podcast that takes you inside the minds of the industry's top professionals, revealing their top secrets to success. I'm your host, Danielle Damiano. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just starting out, get ready to learn the latest trends, strategies, and secrets that will help you succeed. Join us as we go beyond the basics and explore what it takes to make it in the world of real estate. So buckle up and get ready for a wild ride. This is Real Estate Secrets Unlocked. Hey everybody, it's Danielle Damiano and I am here today with another episode of Real Estate Secrets Unlocked and I'm so excited to have Byron and Chrissy Wolf back on again. Um, They are the CEO in CEO of CFO AF, right? Yeah. <laughs> Sounds <a> like that. <laughs> it's so founder. Last time I had you guys on, we talked about real estate investing, tax strategies, tax, you know, hacks and stuff like that. More for like the real estate professional and um, like the sole, you know, real estate agent. Um, so I'm super excited today to have you guys on and talk about maybe a little bit more higher level real estate investor or real estate professional that's really getting, um, you know, involved in obviously real estate and things like that. So why don't you first tell everybody just a little bit about what you do and let's get into it. Okay, Sam, I'll let you take that one. You're much better. Okay. Okay. Well, we work with a lot of small businesses across the country. We help them improve their revenue, their profitability, and decrease their tax liability. So we provide some high level and also very granular uh, support for their small businesses so they can make great decisions that helps them sleep great at night and make more money. And we love working with real estate agents because uh, we have a little bit of background. I came from that field until Byron married me and stole me and forced me to work for him forever and ever. Just brought you into fine us. <laughs> Yes, exactly. Yeah, she's yes. graduated out of the basement. She's allowed uh, her run of the house now. So. No, oh, thank you so much. <laughs> but yeah, we uh, we do fractional CFO stuff uh, for a number of clients, number of industries. Uh, you know, but real estate is really where a lot of wealth is made. Uh, you know, there there's a old adage. It's been told a million different times. So I'm not going to quote one specific person, uh, but they say you know fortunes are made in real estate. Uh, and so there's not a whole lot of millionaires, uh, billionaires that aren't involved in real estate at some level. Uh, and so I find it's very hard if, if that is your intention is to be a millionaire, billionaire. Uh, it's going to be really hard to do that without some uh, ownership or involvement in the real estate world. Uh, it is definitely one of those assets that they're not making any more of uh, as far as land goes. Uh, and there's limited number of structures that exist on those land as well. Uh, so, you know, it's definitely a great field to be in. Uh, we love our real estate partners. They are generally very, very motivated. Uh, they understand our mentality of we are going to work 80 hours a week to avoid a 40 hour uh, a week job. Uh, you know, real estate you know, agents tend to put in a lot of hours. Uh, and so we appreciate that about it. Absolutely. And, you know, I had something the other day that I thought was kind of interesting because a lot of times people will say, oh, you make millions and billions in real estate. But Another thing that a lot of people do is make millions and billions in other industries, but they take their profits and they put it into real estate for all of the tax benefits and strategies to really bring down their tax liability in other areas. And so I think yeah. there are a lot of people out there that make a ton of money, but then they realize, okay, I need to take that money and then invest in real estate to limit that tax liability. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about some of the different tra- tax strategies on a higher level this time um, that people are using? Yeah, 100%. And, and you nailed it. Uh, depreciation is that uh, that magic pill uh, that comes with real estate. And so, you know, there is a ton of people that are making great money and they get involved in real estate uh, mainly for, like you said, it's a great tax strategy. It's a great way to build and grow, you know, build your wealth. Uh, to retain that wealth, you know, it's it's in something that's concrete. It's not an idea, you know. Uh, unfortunately, like even cash at this point is not really backed by a lot, and so you know, you may have a ton of money in the bank, but unfortunately, that's just digits, you know, on a screen for the most part. Uh, so at least with real estate, you know, you can go visit your real estate, you can walk into your real estate if you have properties, 
Uh, you know, you can camp out. I don't know why I've got a thumb up. Uh, you can camp out on the land if you own land. I don't know. Uh, somebody liked my idea. Uh, so, you know, it's it's a great thing to have, but depreciation is that magic pill. And so there's a ton of great tax strategies that exist around being a real estate professional. Um, and a lot of those come back to depreciation. So we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, real quick. Just before we jump into those tax strategies, I want to, uh, again, remind everybody, a real estate professional for tax purposes is different than a real estate professional for a career. Uh, for real estate um, licensed individuals, uh, that's a license you get from you know the state, the city, the county, whatever your you know, your jurisdiction is, uh, and it allows you to sell real estate. That does not necessarily mean that you are now designated a real estate professional for tax reasons. Uh, for tax purposes, it's a minimum of seven hundred fifty hours annually or one hour more than whatever additional job you have. And so that's important to, to throw out uh, because a lot of people get into real estate in the beginning and they are doing something else or doing another job. They have another business. You know, you mentioned that a lot of people, they make great money, then they get into real estate. And so they're like, well, I put in 750 hours. Well, the typical, you know, 50 hour a week job times 40 hours, that's 2000 hours. So if you have a full-time or anywhere close to a full-time job, that's significantly more than 750. Uh, so the individual that has, say, a full-time job, 2,000 hours, that 750 now became 2,001 hours that have to be well-documented. Um, so that needs to be thrown out just so everybody knows. Um, again, like I'm talking strategies at a high level. Uh, so all of this is, is, I guess you would call it tax advice, but tax advice is very specific to the individual. So um, if people are listening to this and they're like, oh, yeah, I heard it from Byron. He's a CPA. Like, you know, I use this, like, I, this, this, you know, talk to a CPA. <laughs> like, don't take this general information and run with it. I'm going to give you as much as I possibly can. Uh, but again, don't make decisions based on this, um, you know, because this, while it is tax advice, this is not individual tax advice right. to individuals. So just have to be safe with that. I got to protect my license, the same as a real estate professional. Uh, these super like, yeah, that's my disclaimer. Uh, so, you know, depreciation is amazing. It does great things. It allows us to depreciate uh, properties and take that off of our income. Um, also, with a real estate professional, one of the big things that we hear a lot is like safe harbor. Uh, so safe harbor is is a great policy that allows us to convert some of that income. So we talked about this before, but there's really three levels of, of income. Uh, passive, you know, has to go against passive and most real estate uh, is passive. So it's not, it's not active. Um, it's not portfolio, you know, it's, it's passive, which means you're not involved in it. So with safe Harbor, there's actually three levels, uh, as a non real estate professional, somebody that's, you know, just happens to have some real estate property. Like if you bought an Airbnb or, you know, you bought some investment property, but you're not actively managing it. You know, you can write off up to $3,000 of those passive losses against your ordinary not a lot of money if you have a significant amount of passive loss losses. The next level is going to be active participation, which is very different from material participation. So active just means that can be management. Uh, it can be, you know, being involved and in, in touching base with the project, project manager, whatever that looks like. Uh, it generally has an hours, but it's not as designated. Um, so the active is a lot easier to prove. Uh, and it can be just as simple as management. You do need to be more than a 10% owner in the property to be active uh, participant, but that's one of the one of the few major guidelines. They do have some hour things that can change. Uh, the, uh, the data source is a little different than material. Uh, with material, it has to be uh, actively involved. It needs to be a certain number of hours. It has to be extremely well documented. The process of documentation cannot change inside of the year. It needs to stay the same from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. Um, but with active participation, you get to write off up to $25,000 of your passive losses against ordinary income or wherever you need. So you can move it up the bucket list. Um, you know, it, that, that scales out at 100,000 AGI. Uh, adjusted gross income at 50% uh, above 100,000. So just by doing the math, you know, 25,150, it's gone. Um, so that's a limit as well, because most people that are involved in real estate probably have an AGI above 100. Uh, you know, but with a real estate professional that is materially involved in the project, it does become ordinary 
income. So you can take that passive and you get to write it off against the other areas of your income. So um, you get the benefit of the capital gains, capital losses, but you also get the write-offs that come from it. So safe harbor is a great rule to have. Um, safe harbor exists in a few different uh, IRS specifications. 269 is probably the most common. 163, there's a couple other ones that exist there. You can Google them. Um, but, you know, it's a great way to write off some of those uh, passive losses that occur. And so the reason I'm talking about passive losses is because we're looking for the maximum amount of write off that we can on the property. So I've had this conversation with some real estate. They say, hey, bought this property, cost me this. I've got this much in rent coming in. My mortgage is this. I'm making money, you know, which is great. Like, I don't have any issue with that. If you need to show that income, that's fantastic. But that's also taxable. Um, so with real estate the really big win comes in maximizing your write-offs so that you are you know taking a loss right now if this is your business if you're and we'll talk a little bit about this later but if you're a real estate broker a real estate dealer uh, then you're in the process of making money this, this is your income um, but for most people that are involved in real estate becoming a real estate professional allows them to have the losses they're going to go against business income w2 income whatever that looks like. so with the with those losses, we're looking to write off as much as we possibly can uh, to maximize that passive loss that we can now apply to our ordinary income, capital gains, anything that we, you know, would like to do that uh, on. Um, so the the fastest way is with a cost segregation study, uh, which I know we briefly talked about um, last time. But the cost segregation study allows us to take a property it can't be our personal property, um, but any investment property. Yeah, a rental property, you know, uh, commercial property, whatever. It's not a personal. Uh, it allows us to break it down into multiple components. So there are the things that are immediately written off um, that are involved in that. That can be, you know, appliances and a number of other things that are essentially things you would just go buy, install. You know, um, those can be written off immediately. So that's a big chunk. Uh, then there's your five, your seven, your fifteen year. Um, of course, the land is not. The land doesn't get depreciated because it's not going where they don't make any more of it. Uh, but, you know, there's other things, your roof, your AC, uh, a lot of your interior walls, uh, load-bearing, non-load-bearing, things like that nature, they're going to have different levels of depreciation. So we're taking something that would normally be, say, a 27 and a half year, uh, and we're pulling pieces out of it, and we're taking this piece and writing it off now. We're taking this piece that would normally be divided by 27 and a half. We're dividing it by five, so obviously much bigger number. Dividing other pieces by seven, other years by 15, and then the land exists at that high level uh, for the most part, right? So, you know, call it 30. So we got this 30 year, you know, product that we're accelerating that depreciation, which even if we're making income, we have cash coming in from the rents, our cash going out to the mortgage, if we have, you know, a mortgage on the property, which most people do. Uh, that's, that's fine. That's cash inflow, cash outflow. You probably have a positive cash flow in that. Uh, which would normally be taxed if we didn't take advantage of the depreciation. But because we have this long list of depreciation, we now get to stack them underneath it. So we've got cash coming in. We got depreciation that goes against it. So we're not paying tax on this income that we would if we didn't do it. But we're probably going well under that with a loss, a passive loss, that now we get to apply that to other income. So capital gains, ordinary income, whatever that looks like. So you end up, you still show good income, the beauty of it banks don't look at depreciation a lot of these other things as um as you taking a loss and being a bad credit risk they look at that top number and they say all right cool depreciation's out because it's not a cash item so this property makes money you know they're doing well with this they're making money over here with their other business their w2 whatever so you're a great credit risk you can continue to buy properties even though you've taken advantage of the tax strategies to significantly reduce or sometimes eliminate your entire taxable liability. Uh, and so that's why it works so well. And that's why I love what you said. Even people that aren't in real estate end up in real estate, you know, if they want to be a millionaire, billionaire, whatever, um, because of the amazing tax strategies that come from it. So uh, that's just a quick overview of depreciation. Like I said, depreciation is really that magic pill that comes into play. Uh, but there's also some other uh, strategies that we can, we can definitely go into if you want to get into some more yeah and I, and I want to you know just um touch upon one of the things that you said that was so true because i'm in mortgage i do loans i see tax returns you know every day 
um, when we're looking at tax returns, whether it's in real estate or it's, you know, just a business owner, um, we always look at that adjusted gross income, the number at the bottom, but we do add back the depreciation and the depletion. That is income that can be added back when we're calculating the income. So great point there. You can use it in tax, you know, write off strategies. But that income is not going to penalize you when you go to get a loan because we add that back in. So good point there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I love that. Love that. It, when, um, before we were, you know, uh, before we got on here, we were talking a little bit about like a real estate dealer and, and things like that. And I just wanted, want you to talk a little bit more about what a real estate dealer is different than a real estate professional. What are some of those tax, you know, um, benefits and strategies and stuff like that? Yeah, of course. So a real estate dealer, they're actively involved in essentially flipping properties. Uh, so the designation with a real estate dealer is they're not looking for long term. Uh, they're generally looking for short term. So they're getting into a property. Uh, they're they're buying that property with the intention of flipping that property. So there's no long term. There's no intentions of of receiving rent. Nothing says that you can't receive rent, right? Like you can. But the intention is not to receive rent. It's it's short term, not long term. Uh, the advantage to the real estate dealer is that everything becomes ordinary income. So we we have bypassed the passive uh, like PAL and all the other issues that can arise. Uh, we're not dealing with passive. It is ordinary um, because of that. Essentially, flipping that the property becomes inventory. So, you know, we, we're exempt from 1031 exchange, which is a negative for sure. Uh, we're exempt from depreciation on these. Again, huge negative. Um, but that's because the property is an inventory item. No different than if you, you know, if you had a store that was selling trucks, you know, those trucks are inventory. You, you buy trucks from wherever you get them and then you sell those trucks to other people. You're taxed on uh, the difference between what you sold that truck for and what you paid for that truck. Same thing with the real estate, um, you know, a uh, uh, real estate dealer, they're only getting taxed on that. So, you know, that can be good if that's your main business, you want to show that income, you want everything to be ordinary, you want it to avoid all the complexities of depreciation, 1031 exchange, all these others. Uh, the negative, again, is that you don't have those as a tax strategy. So, the, the real estate dealer is a very, very complicated strategy um, where the benefit only comes into play when you start to separate these out. Uh, so a real estate dealer has the ability to separate. So they one of the few times you can exist in both worlds. You can be a real estate dealer on the flips, the things that you're buying just to turn around and sell. You want that ordinary income that comes from it. You can also have other items that exist in the real estate professional world that are going to uh, qualify for 1031 exchange, cost segregation studies, all the other benefits that you have. And so the reason I say it's complicated is, is having both of these and knowing how to utilize both sides of it is a complicated dance. Um, so 100%, this, these are people that have gotten to a point where they probably have somebody uh, actively managing their portfolio um, probably have a CFO person that's saying, hey, this needs to go here. This needs to go here. This is our balance. This is our forecast. So we're we're expected to make this much money this year in this project. We need this much over here in our real estate professional world that we can use for, for write-offs to offset that. So we show an income. But like you had said, you know, when you're looking at it for mortgages, that that money comes off, uh, off of that, that loss, comes back in. So it shows an income. So it is very, very complicated. The the benefit comes in play when you are strategic and balancing out your essentially, and I, I say flips, but you know, that's just a common term for buying something and then immediately reselling it or attempting to immediately resell. Uh, and then having the properties that are over here that are rent or whatever. Uh, and you do need to designate that. So you can even have a project that exists in both worlds. Um that gets super complicated, but you can have a project that you purchase, uh, you know, specifically to flip. Um, but then there's there's a rental aspect uh, of that that can happen. A lot of times that is uh, people that are buying multiple properties. They package those together to resell. 
Um, but there's a time frame to do that. You know, I'm going to buy 10 properties uh, and then I'm going to turn these 10 properties into this package that I'm going to sell to a, re, uh, a real estate investment trust uh, or an investor or whatever that looks like. So we need to take out the ones that we want to keep over here for the rental or to get the depreciation or whatever that looks like. Keep in mind, if you pull this out, you take advantage of that, you throw it back in, you've depreciated the value. So now that inventory item has become significantly less in value. So we offset any gain that we have from the depreciation by now having this big gap between what we paid and what we sold because we've reduced what we paid by the depreciated amount. Um, so that can be a very complicated strategy. I would highly suggest nobody does that until they have got really good at the flips. Um, if they're only doing flips, you know, purely doing flips. Are you flip? Because it, it took a minute for me to kind of like wrap my head around exactly like real estate dealer, but I think I know what you're referring to. So wholesalers basically will, let's just say they have a property, they meet with a seller, the seller says, hey, I'll sell it to you for $200,000. What they do is then they go and sell it to somebody else for two twenty. dollars Right. So they're immediately they may close on it. They may not close on it. Sometimes they it might be a simultaneous close. Sometimes they don't really have to. They just get their assignment fee, you know, at the closing table and you have the end buyer. I think that might be what you're referring to when you're talking about real estate dealer. Um, and then the flips. I mean, we my husband and I flip properties. Um, so basically you buy a property and we bought from wholesalers or, you know, dealers. Yeah. Right. You buy a property for two hundred. Um, you put a hundred thousand dollars into it and then you sell it for, you know, whatever for, you know, four fifty. Um, so those are more of like your fix and flip type of properties. So when you talk real estate dealer, are you meaning like those wholesalers that are not really holding the property very long, right? They're just turning them quickly. Uh, yes and no. So a wholesaler is, is a different Yes, they're they're essentially doing that. They're doing that at probably the lowest level uh, of a real estate dealer um, because a lot of times they're selling the contract. You know, they're not really selling the home. So it wouldn't really apply there unless they're actually taking possession of it. Selling the contract or selling the right is going to have kind of that same piece because that is ordinary income um, when they do that because they didn't take possession of anything. So there is no inventory item. Um, it's just essentially selling a service. So you're a broker, um, so to speak. Uh, you know, so yes, kind of, but not exactly. So when I talk about that, that real estate dealer, some of that does apply um, because there is some of that same tax uh, benefits and, and differences in that. Um, and, and I would assume when you're talking flip, uh, you're not talking like buying a property and essentially selling it immediately as is. Uh, you're talking about buying a rehab and then selling for an increased rate, right? Exactly. In this day and age, yeah. now, I can say back in 07, we were flipping a lot of properties and like not even, you know, uh, you can flip them in a day and not have to do anything. Yeah. But yeah, in this market, for sure. Yeah. So with those, I have found um, if you're going to do the rehabs and then sell them for a significantly higher ticket, uh, it's still good to take advantage of the real estate professional. Um, because we get to write off all of those pieces. We can do the depreciation that that will allow us to, to take that hit. Um, and there's enough that goes into it that we can boost the value on the rehab so that our capital gains aren't as bad. Um, and because we're a real estate professional, we get to take advantage of the ordinary income rules. Um, so I would still suggest for like that nature to not do the real estate dealer um, because it does get more complicated with the, with a real estate dealer if you're doing a rehab remodel anything like that uh so when i when i say flip um and i'm not using the term correctly uh i mean like bought a property immediately throw it back on the market the way that it sits uh okay. or buying multiple properties to combine those properties and sell that uh as it sits so there's there's a very short window of purchase to sale um, and that's why you know when you're talking about you know our wholesalers uh, yes, that it's some of the same tax consequences, benefits uh, that apply would apply to um, to them as well. Uh, but that's really most of the time that's selling a contract. Very rarely do they actually take possession uh, of the home to resell it, like you said, unless generally same day or maybe some kind of next day. Right. 
uh, but they generally don't take possession. They're generally not doing any kind of rehab, remodel. I mean, I've seen some wholesalers go in and do some things to try to get more money, um, but that gets super complicated on the write-offs because technically it's not their home when they do that because they have to take right. possession. So you can get into some hot water in that scenario. But I, I, I love that point. That's a great point. I'm glad you asked it because it does help me to clarify uh, why you would be a real estate dealer and exactly what that means. So um, it does not really apply to the rehab, remodel scenario. Um, really, it's just in the, the true like buy it, hold it for a very short period of time sell it for more money. Um, but wholesaler, 100%, that that comes into play. Real estate uh, wholesaler, uh, been around for a long time, but it's become very popular uh, fairly recently, you know, because of the huge appreciation value of the property, which has been fantastic. Uh, you know, and I think like when we get the pullback on the rate, um, I think we'll still have that. I know there's still wholesalers that are doing, you know, extremely well. Uh, I've seen some wholesalers that are focused in the avenue of, essentially holding the the mortgage uh i've seen yeah. some of those go up which i think is a great strategy if you can buy the contract uh and somebody can buy it taking advantage of the two point or the three point rate uh that the owner has like that's an amazing way to sell a property for a significant boost because people know that you know like when you bought a property at 2.7 and now the rates at what seven something uh yeah, that's I think I've been some of the instances. Yeah, and in some lives, yeah, I've been higher. You know, so like the payment at at three percent, you know, it can be double. Oh, uh, yeah. same home, same value. You know, when you go up to that, you know, that eight percent bar. Uh, so having the ability to to hold the rate, that's huge. Um, I love that strategy. I know we kind of got off topic, but I, I think it's a great strategy. And I think that there's going to be a, if if we continue to see a rate increase, which I hope that we see a drop in Q1. Um, if we continue to see that, I think that strategy is going to be huge for a number of wholesalers, uh, just because of the simple fact of most people can't afford, uh, the, the, you know, the monthly, you know, right. with the rate being as high as it is, they're looking at half of the house that they could earlier, uh, based on their rates, you know, and, and unfortunately, or fortunately, whatever you want to say, people don't have five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars just sitting around waiting right. to buy a home, you know, that. At this point, in major cities, that's a starter problem. Like, you know, it's you know, it is what it is. I mean, it's crazy to think, uh, you know, but it's there is no eighty hundred thousand dollars starter homes anymore. Like, yeah. it, those don't exist. You know, so and you're spending good money. Was like ninety, so. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. That ninety thousand dollar home nowadays is probably a shed in somebody's backyard, right? Yeah, I mean, it's just exactly. <laughs> well, mine was not the Taj Mahal, but. <laughs> well, yeah, but it's probably better than. Better than yeah, yeah. My my DJ doesn't buy you your clutch. Yeah, and there's a, and I mean there's no more of those AD twenty loans and all of those other things, the pay option arms, you know, all that stuff. I mean it it's full fully amortized, you know, thirty year fix, putting, you know, a decent amount down. I want to go back to something because I was thinking about this about what you said with the real estate dealer and how they're in stem from the ten thirty one. Is that because of the time frame that okay. I yeah. just wasn't sure so, if there was another reason or. Yeah. So the 1031 exchange is very specifically uh, involves that depreciation. So it, it's going to impact, you know, minimize the impact of the depreciation that's on it. Uh, and it is specifically for taking uh, an asset that is subject to the capital gains, capital losses, and uh, exchanging that for another one to essentially defer the, the tax implications of it. So a real estate dealer everything that they do is is this is inventory and i sell it and now i'm paying on the difference so everything is ordinary income the depreciation doesn't come into play uh so that that's why the 1031 uh doesn't work you know so now I, the argument could be made that essentially it's it's kind of the same concept you know you you sell it for this and now you have this additional cash that you use to buy this property and now because you sold it for more you can buy a more expensive property and that works as well uh, but again, you just, the basis, you know, like with the 1031 exchange, you need to know basis, you can increase the basis, increases the tax, defer the tax, same concept with a real estate, uh, you know, dealer, because they, they bought something that has this value. They sold it for more money. They have the option to buy something with that more money, or they can buy something for less money, even if they wanted to, 
So there's more availability for decisions. Uh, you know, they don't have the time limitations. You know, with the 1031 exchange, we really need to have our next property needs to be ready to go. Like they should have spoken to you before they even thought about selling the property, you know, because they need to know, hey, we're approved. This is the property we want. You know, we're we're selling this one and then we're immediately getting into this one. Um, you know, and they do have like a time frame in that, but it's not long. You know, it's it's a basically 30 days. Uh, so to, to know that you've got to make this swap so quickly, you know, that can be stressful. So at least with the real estate dealer, um, they can take forever if they want to buy another property because it's inventory. Like you don't, you're not forced to do it. Uh, obviously, you know, the longer it takes them to buy a property, that's less inventory that they have to sell. Um, so that can limit what they have. You know, same thing with a, uh, I get a real estate licensed professional, you know, not talking about tax purposes, but if you're a real estate professional, you need buyers, you need sellers, preferably both. If you don't have buyers, you don't have sellers, you know, you're not doing anything. You, you know, you're just, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, another job, maybe Uber. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was funny. I had Uber pick me up one day to bring me to the airport and he was also a realtor. He had like his sign on the car and stuff like that. Um, so two, two more questions. Um, one of the, well, First, I just want to make a point about the 1031 exchange. I can't tell you how many times I have people call me and they're all excited and they're like, I just sold my home. I want to buy another investment property. I'm going to do a 1031 exchange. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. like, did the money go into your bank account or did it go into the, you know, intermediary or whatever it's called with the 1031? Oh, no, it's in my bank account. I'm like, well, you really can't do a 1031 exchange. I know that there might be a way around it, but it's very expensive um, and probably not worth it. Um, so just want to point that out to people. If you are thinking to do a 1031 exchange, you have to think about that before you sell your home because the money from the proceeds cannot go into your actual checking account. It has to go through the exchange. Um, so a self-directed IRAs. When would you use a self-directed IRA over a 1031 exchange or is, are they, you know, what would be the, I guess the pros and cons? Yeah. So the, the 1031 exchange is, is predominantly for individuals. Like you just said, and I, I thank you for bringing up that point. Cause that, that's exactly what I, I get that same call. Uh, just sold a property. We're going to do a 1031 exchange. I'm like, Hey, that's awesome. What's the property you're buying? I don't know. You know, we're looking. Well, like you're too late. Yeah. <laughs> or like what you said, you know, like, uh, you know, well, did you, did you accept the money? Yeah. Yeah. It's in my account. I'm ready to go. Like, you know, let's buy this next property. Well, yeah, it's over. <laughs> you messed up. You should have called me before. Right. Uh, so same situation. And, and honestly, if they did call me before, that's going to be where I'm going to tell them. I'm going to be like, you, you need to call the ADL. Like she needs to get you approved for whatever it is you're looking at. Right. You need to, we need to pick some properties, not a property. Cause that can still fall through. You need probably three, realistically. Uh, this is my primary. This is my backup. This is my backup to the backup, right? You can designate an area, like, you know, things of that nature. So there are some things you can do to maximize the ability uh, or the availability. But it's very it, it's very tight. Um, so anyways, it's in direct exchange, very, pretty much for individuals, buy a property. Hey, we bought this single family. Now we're ready to go duplex. Now we're ready to go triplex, quadplex, blah, blah, blah up the line that that's the progression normally um you can do it differently you can sell a property buy two properties like that can be done right. um so there's yeah there's things that you can do outside of that but again exactly like you just said like they need to have a conversation with you before they even think about selling what what are my options where am i at what does this look like for me because you know if you're not really focused on your credit score um, or if you're in an LLC and you're trying to do this with your business credit score, if you don't know these things, like those can change dramatically uh, without watching them and really kind of being on top of them. So, anyway, so back that self-directed IRA question. I love a self-directed IRA. Um, huge fan of that. I think that you can do it in like a self-directed traditional as well. Uh, although really you're just tax deferring, right? Um, with the self-directed IRA, it's after tax dollars. So I'm sure a lot of people already know this. I'll go over that. Self-directed IRA, you've already paid the tax on it. This is after tax dollars. So essentially you're paying it on the seed, not on the crop. Um, so you've paid the tax already. The money goes in the self-directed IRA. 
you buy a property, right? The growth is tax-free. When you pull it out at retirement, tax-free as well. Uh, the beauty of it being in the self-directed IRA is you can buy properties. You know, you can sell those properties. That money comes into the self-directed IRA. It can't come to you. Same scenario you just said. Can't come to you. Uh, so it goes into the account of the self-directed IRA, and you don't have the restrictions of the 1031 exchange because it's not taxed. That money just came back in, essentially an inventory item like we talked about earlier, and now we can go find another property. So you can do it the same as you would a 1031 exchange. In fact, I would say that that's extremely intelligent if you're in a self-directed IRA to do that, uh, just so that you're not just taking money in and then hoping to eventually put it out. You want your money working for you and growing. So I love the concept of the 1031 exchange, uh, but you don't have to do that. Now with a traditional, you know, you've deferred that and so, yes, now we do have that restriction. So we do want to have it in the 1031 exchange so that we're continuing to defer uh, the uh, the tax on that item. So it continues to grow. We're not paying tax on it as it builds. We're paying tax on the crop. So we planted the seed, right? Crops are growing. We want them to continue to grow. Uh, and if we harvest, we want to put more in so it continues to grow. So we're going to pay it on what it grows to. So different concept um, with the self-directed IRA versus say like a solo 401k or a, a self-directed traditional, um, maybe a SEP. Uh, so any of these ones, I mean, I've, I've even seen people try to put these things to HSAs, which is a uh, health savings uh, account. So, you know, we've seen some crazy stuff happen. But yeah, you know, the 1031 exchange, it's an amazing system to, to have available. It really is probably one of the best. Uh, I don't want to say loopholes because it's it's a tried and true strategy and the, the IRS is completely aware that it exists and wants you to use it. Um, but it's a great strategy to use for anybody that wants to level up uh, their investment game, like level up their properties and you know they don't want to pay tax on something. And especially if they're going to buy another property, you know, so like your example, that person calls you and they say, hey, I want to do this turn 31 exchange. You say, hey, you know, did you take the money? Yeah, we got the money in the account. I mean, you're basically out. So now we've got to pay tax on that, which reduces the amount that we have. And then we're going to go try to buy another property. And we're just starting the whole thing all over again when we could have avoided, you know, having to pay that tax. I mean, I, I, I don't know what you charge, but I know for a fact the taxes on that, it's way less than anything that you're going to charge for this. Nah. this stuff. So, you know, just by having that conversation with you on a regular basis, you know, of, hey, this is what we're doing. This is what we're involved in. And, and I tell people all the time, like, if you want to get into real estate, you you can't do it alone. You need a team. You need to find a mortgage broker that you love, that you work with, that will take your calls, you know, that that you can talk strategy with, strategy. not somebody. Yeah. Yeah. Strat it's everything. So if they have that person, and generally you know the people that they can go to outside of that. So you're probably the best person for them to first contact with. And then you can look at it and you can say, hey, look, you know, your stuff's a mess. Like you go to the CPA or, you know, go, go, you know, do this, or this is what you need to do. Here's the agent. You know, like, I know you can't say, hey, this is the, you know, got to offer options. Um, but like, you're, you're a great outlet for that because you're, you're not trying to sell them on a particular home. You're just trying to put them in the best spot for it. You're not trying to do their taxes or anything like that. You're just saying, hey, it's a mess. Got to get this cleaned up. Here's some people that I know are good. Here's some options. So they, you can really be a partner for them and where they want to be in that process. Uh, that's not just there to like make money, right? Like, I mean, obviously that's the whole point while we're in business, but there's no, there's no benefit to them getting advice from you necessarily other than that relationship that comes with working with you, uh, you know, in long term. Yeah, it's all about, I mean, looking at the whole situation. And th that's why people will call me and say, so what's your interest rate? Well, I don't know. Like, I don't know what you qualify for. I don't know what loan program. I don't know what your credit score is. How much do you want to put down? All of that goes into interest rates and payments. And so once I can see the entire situation, I can either say, yes, this is what you're approved for, or let's put you on a plan for the next six months to be able to get you into an, a home. The great thing for investors is that there's so many programs out there where it's no income. In some cases, no asset. They look at the specific property and the credit score of the person buying, and you can even close them in a business name. So there's a lot of loans out there where it's like, okay, we're going to do this type of loan. And then, you know, if you're going to refinance in the future, we'll get you all set up so that everything's looking good to refi. 
Um, last question, since we're getting onto mortgage, um, what are some of the biggest write-offs? Because obviously interest rates are high, right? And so for a person that's, and I'm not talking like real estate and real estate investing or just someone buying a home, what are the biggest write-offs on that home closing that you can use um, uh, you know, as a tax strategy or to, you know, reduce your liability. Yeah. So, you know, if you're, if you're buying a home, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that can go into that, uh, into that write off, like obviously all this closing costs are the other things that are associated with, uh, you can write off the, uh, the, the interest on that. Um, so there's a lot of things you can write off. I will say probably one of the best things you can use as a real estate, uh, professional, um, is you can convert your primary resident uh, to an investment property, which gives you the ability to depreciate that property. And so I, I would say as a real estate professional, if you have a personal resident that and you need that deduction or whatever, I would make that conversion. I mean, that's probably one of the best uh, things available to a real estate professional is the ability to take a personal residence, convert that to uh, the investment property, and now we can do the, uh, the all the write-offs that come with the cost segregation. And you can start writing off your management fees, like you know your repairs. All these things that go into home ownership are now available to you as write-offs because it's now a business. It's not a resident, so you are still paying, you know, uh, essentially rent at that point, you know, because you converted it. Uh, but like you just said, you know, there's so many programs that allow you to close in an LLC, which is fantastic. Uh, so you have this ability to do that. And then as you do that and you get good at that, I think the next step for a real estate professional is the ability uh, you know, within that to do the special allocations. And so a real estate professional becomes honestly probably one of the best partners that a non-real estate professional can have going, wow, that was amazing. Oh. Uh, <laughs> where that came from. Uh, that's pretty cool though. Uh, so yeah, I don't know, fireworks. Uh, I got a, is that like a time thing we went over? <laughs> That was awesome. Yeah, no, is, that a, is that a first time, Danielle, for the uh, no, never seen that. Yeah. Uh, has that happened to you before? Like, I've never no. seen it. You never it looks like that. snow. So, yeah, yeah. It must be your AI. <laughs> it must be. I don't know what that was. That was pretty magic cool. happening. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, so early for all of this. It's not even much time. Look. But, uh, you know, as a real estate professional, as you as you get these skills and you make these conversions, that special allocation makes you a great partner for somebody that wants to get into real estate uh, because you can, you're allowed inside of that LLC that you have a partnership with, you can do the allocation of how things play out. So you can allocate depreciation, allocate income, um, you know, allocate losses. So, like, depending on where they fall in the bucket and who your partners are, you can allocate these things as a real estate investor so that it has the maximum benefit for the people that you're involved with. Uh, I would say if that is a strategy that you want to move forward with, they, uh, you know, the real estate uh, agent, real estate professional, 100% needs to talk to somebody like you that that can help them through that process. You know, Because as you know, one person buying a home is way easier than an LLC or like multiple entities or multiple member LLC buying a property. Like that gets complicated. Um, but the advantages that can come from that are huge. So they need somebody like you that can walk them through that process and make sure that they're doing it correctly. And honestly, even if they know how to do it, I would argue way better to pay somebody to, to do that stuff, like to handle it, because your time is much better used in, in the actual real estate that's going on um, so that you can move forward. Like tons of people can do their own taxes, right? Like I can do them a lot better. I, I can find a lot more write-offs that are going to way pay for whatever the fee is, uh, you know, and they're going to be accurate. And that's not most people's best use of their time. No, you know, so, no. you know, yeah, utilize the professionals. Exactly. And one of the things just, you know, last point here is that um, you mentioned turning your primary into an investment property. Fannie Mae just changed the guidelines on a two to four unit, right? So if I was in my early 20s, the, what I would be doing right now is I would be buying a two to four unit property as a primary residence. The minimum down is 5%. So you put 5% down on a two to four unit. It's a primary. You got to live in it for a year. 
A year later, you can convert that into an investment property and then you can go and do it again, right? I mean, you literally pick up five, two to four units in five years. And yeah. you're, the, what you're collecting rent from the other units could potentially, you know, obviously reduce your monthly payment or who knows, maybe you're getting enough rent that it's covering your monthly mortgage payment, right? So that's yeah. what, if I was young right now, that's what I would be doing. Um, unfortunately, I agree. stage of my life, I cannot live in a duplex. <laughs> yeah but if i was 20 i would <laughs> yeah no i did i love that i mean you know for anybody that's getting into real estate or even somebody that that you know has no intentions of being a real estate person uh i mean that's an amazing strategy that you've started that process you know and and like you said it it can pay your entire mortgage so you're living for free you may even be making money if you buy it right, right. you know and and then you're set up for that 1031 exchange to move into the next big one, next, you know, next one. And as you develop in life and you get to, you know, uh, the age you are or even older when you get to my age and you're like, I don't want to live with shared walls, right? Like you <laughs> turn that straight into an investment and you can buy a single family property and your, your multi may be paying all of this and your single family and you're living for free. Like, I, I agree with you. If I was 20, 100%, that's exactly what I'd be. Or 18. Yeah. Well, you'd start at 18. You know, might need mom and dad to co sign, but it's, it's right. possible. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you guys both so much for being on a ton of tax tips. Um, if anybody wants to reach out to you, where can they find you? What's their website? And I'll put everything in the comments as well. Absolutely. They can find us at cfoas.com. And you can email us at hello at cfoaf.com. And, uh, you know, we'll get back to you pretty quick. So reach out with your questions. We're happy to help. Absolutely. And they're nationwide. So, like, they don't, you don't have to think, oh, well, I live in Massachusetts. So I'm, you know, they're in Arizona or wherever. Can't call them. They're nationwide. They can help you. They work with people nationwide. Um, they will reduce your tax liability. They're awesome. So cfoaf.com, Byron and Trusty Wolf. Um, thank you guys. This was fun. Like a ton of great information, um, especially for real estate agents, real estate investors. So I appreciate it. Thank you yeah, so much, no Daniel. Thanks for having me. Ollie. Bye, Bye. guys. Well, that's a wrap. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Real Estate Secrets Unlocked. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on your favorite platform, and we would love your feedback. Check us out on social and let me know what topics you want more of. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel and our show. I'm your host, Danielle Damianov, and until next time, Stay motivated, stay excited, and keep growing in this crazy world of real estate. Thanks for listening to Real Estate Secrets Unlocked.